Hi, welcome to County Connection. My name is Julie Souter, and first up today, we are here to talk with uh, County Clerk and Recorder Kathy Neal about upcoming elections. Uh, welcome, Kathy. Thanks, Julie. Um, so this is a bit of a busy year for the Clerk and Recorder's Office, and the Election Office in particular, um, starting off with some primaries. So um, when are the primaries? The primaries are June 24th. That's a Tuesday. Um, the county will be conducting, in fact, the whole state conducts elections by mail ballot now. So all registered electors who are affiliated with either the Democrat, Republican, or the American Constitution Party will receive a ballot in the mail automatically. Okay, and so some states have open primaries where anyone can vote in any primary they choose, but Colorado has closed primaries. So um, can you talk a little bit about the eligibility requirements? For Correct. Um, the ballots will be mailed to Democrats, Republicans, and American Constitution Party. Those voters who are unaffiliated may affiliate at any time between now and Election Day if they wish to participate in the primary. Okay, so if you're a registered Democrat, for example, you can only register or you can only vote in Democratic primaries. Same thing across the board for Republicans, Constitution Party, etc. Correct. Cetera. Yes. Okay. And um, and so, what races are on the primary ballot this year? Um, we have Governor, uh, Representative to the United States Congress, Secretary of State, United States Senator, tre State Treasurer, Attorney General, um, District Attorney. And then the county offices are county commissioner, district one, county clerk, treasurer, assessor, sheriff, surveyor, and coroner. Okay. And of those races, which ones have primaries? Um, they all have primaries, but the only contested race is the Republican race for governor. Okay. Um, so then... Um, the deadline has already passed for folks who want to withdraw their affiliation for the purpose of voting in a primary. Um, however, if you're unaffiliated, you have all the way up to Election Day Correct. Um, to affiliate. So how do people go about doing that? They can um, go online to Go Vote Colorado and change their party affiliate or affiliate with a party, and that will automatically, we will, once we update their record, we will issue them a ballot. Okay. And is there a deadline to do that online, or, or how does that work? There um, is eight days before the election, um, and that's not the deadline, but that's the last day we can mail a ballot out because okay. of the, you know, how, how long it takes the ballots to go back and forth. But they can do it through our office or at inter any of the voting service polling centers through election day. Okay, so can they claim an affiliation at the polling center yes. on election? Okay, there will be a form they can fill out, and then they can unaffiliate after they vote if they wish to do so. Okay, um, so the um, the mail component of elections in Colorado is is fairly new, um, mm -hmm. and so for folks who are unfamiliar with the processes and the timelines and and how mailing fits into all that, um, can you explain some of that? Sure. Um, the ballots will be mailed on June 2nd. I encourage everyone that to check their voter registration at Go Vote Colorado or, or call our office. We're happy to help to make sure we have your most current mailing address because it, if it, they do not forward ballots, so if you're not at your former P.O. box, it's going to come back undeliverable. So, um, and for those people that wish to vote in person, which people still like to do that, mm -hmm. they can vote in person from uh, June 16th through the 24th at the courthouse and on election day at the courthouse, the Silverthorne Pavilion and the County Commons. All right, fantastic. So um, lastly, where can people go to get more information about voting and registration and all the various dates as we go through the primaries and beyond into November. Um, you can check out our website, um, www.co.summit.co.us, <laughs> and click on uh, the Clerk and Recorder Elections. Okay, great. And it has information about where you can get a ballot. If you don't get a ballot, what you need to do, where you can drop ballots off, and anything that's not answered, please call our office, and we're happy to help. Great. And what's your phone number there at the office? 970 Four five three three four seven nine. All right, great. Anything else you'd like to add about election season, Kathy? 
I just really want to encourage people to make sure their voter registration is up to date and we have their correct mailing address. It's a lot of ballots come back undeliverable and it would save a lot of taxpayer dollars if we had everyone's correct address. All right, great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Julie. All right, so govotecolorado.com or co.summit.co.us um, or you can call Kathy's office anytime. Thanks so much and stick with us. Uh, next up, we will be talking about flood preparedness. Welcome back to County Connection. Our next guest is Joel Cochran, Emergency Manager for Summit County. Welcome, Joel. Hi, Julie. And we are here to talk about flood preparedness. Um, we have had a very snowy winter, which has been great in a lot of ways, um, but it does carry with it the risk of flooding. So um, based on what we know about the snowpack right now and the weather, um, what can we expect in the way of flooding in Summit County? Well, I hope we can expect no flooding. That would be the best for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I think our chances are probably 50-50. Uh, okay. We have, as you said, a great snowpack, which we've enjoyed all winter. And uh, now the weather pattern is going to bring it off and put it in the rivers. OK. So how does this year compare historically with years past, um, particularly the years when we've seen flooding previously? We're right up there in some of our highest total years. And uh, our totals are still adding as we uh, had snow this past weekend. Right. And so we're, uh, you know, in the 150 plus percentile of normal snowpack for this type of time of year. And, and that snowpack should be coming off the mountains and it's just uh, hanging out. Right. Yeah. And in fact, up high, it's really it feels like it's still winter oh, on sure a lot does. of days lately. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so why is it important to talk about flood preparedness and flood risk in the context of what we've seen historically? Well, the history is really important because our county, um, because we're a headwater basin, you know, we see a lot of snow mm -hmm. and we see a lot of runoff. And uh, what matters to us are these peak years where when mixed with a weather pattern, then the snowpack melts really rapidly. And uh, so that's why we're looking this year um, because um, our snowpack is substantial and our weather patterns have been very warm at times and then very cool. And you know, if that pattern persists into uh, July, our snow will come off nice and easy. But if we have a really sharp warm up like we did a week ago, uh, all of the inflows uh, you know, doubled overnight uh, in that, that course of those three or four days. And um, so what are kind of the key um, weather patterns that people need to look for um, in order to, to kind of know that some of that high water might be coming? Right. Well, the public can watch the same weather patterns we're watching. And so we're, we're looking for these five day warm ups where the daytime temperatures are in the mid to high 50s and then in the 60s. And then the nighttime temperatures, those same nights are above freezing. And what happens on those days is you get a perpetual uh, 24 hour melt, basically. Mm -hmm. And the snow come that fourth or fifth day is, is really melting at a high altitude. And so it's really filling up the rivers. OK, uh, so I know that uh, all the agencies around the um, county have been keeping their eye on the snowpack and keeping their eye on the weather. Right. Um, so what are the thing, what are some of the things that um, that all the various government agencies in the county are doing to prepare for the possibility of flooding? Great. So we actually start meeting in April. We have our first spring runoff meeting in April and we invite the weather service and uh, kind of the river forecasting centers. And so we want them to give us a projection of what the rest of the spring looks like. And that's a time when the county road and bridge and the, the town public works departments really start going out and looking at culverts and uh, making sure that uh, debris is away from the water channels that we want water to flow, uh, you know, across our streets and through people's properties and right. things down into the rivers. And so we really spend a lot of time with steamer trucks uh, the road and bridge departments and, and uh, those people, their crews start cleaning out those ditches. And, um, and when you say steamer trucks, they're melting out those mm, That's right. They're, yep, they're melting icing. the ice out of the culverts yeah. and so that, the, so that debris can be removed and so that ice, because um, we can have ice dams as well as uh, log debris and things like that in our pipes and our culverts. And so the public works and the road and bridge departments get after that kind of problem so that when our runoff does get going in uh, early June, that the waterways are free. Mm -hmm. um, how about any other preparations that you'd like to mention about um, 
let's see, I, I've heard a lot about sandbags. And right. So at that April meeting, we start talking about where we're going to put our sand piles out and the availability of sandbags. And that information is all available on the county's website. Uh, we have a um, consolidated uh, brochure of all the municipalities and the county government, special, some special districts. And in the pages there, there are phone numbers and uh, contact information about how to get a hold of a road and bridge department or public works and uh, get sandbags. And, and then we put sand piles out in neighborhoods. And on that brochure is a, a map on the last page with the locations of those piles. Okay, and one of the things I've seen in that brochure is it has some pretty handy diagrams about how to make an effective yeah. uh, levy <laughs> um, if it comes to that. That's right, it's not as simple as it seems. And uh, so there's a stacking table guide in there about height and width and uh, how many sand, how to fill sandbag. It's uh, not, not quite as straightforward as it seems. And uh, so that what you do create is sturdy. And because um, it's a really important preparedness piece for the public. In the areas in the county that have seen flooding in the past, those typically are the areas that see flooding again. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it really helps if the public understands about those areas. Maybe homeowners here weren't here in our previous big flood years of 95 or 2002. And um, so it'd be good to find out if that property was susceptible to flooding and get some sandbags out now. Cause the worst thing we want to have the public calling is, you know, emergency request for sand on a street to try to protect a property. And that that's really dangerous for everyone. And it's just really difficult to work in an emergency situation like that. Okay. And so for folks who have um, moved to the county since one of those um, previous big snow years um, historically, how would they go about finding out whether their property is susceptible? They could talk to any of the town, town or the county engineering offices. Okay. They could also talk to those same road and bridge and, the, and uh, public works departments because uh, those directors uh, have been here for a number of years through these previous flood events in our county and mm -hmm. uh, happy to advise you know someone from the public if there have been problems on that property. Okay, great. Um, are there any other preparations that citizens should undertake? Well, we just really need to watch the weather. Uh, if there is an emergency, they really need to listen to what uh, public safety agencies are advising them, mm -hmm. and uh, stay away from stay away from swift water when there's no flooding, because that's water we enjoy to recreate in. But it's uh, you know it's moving very quickly this time of year, and the streams have more than doubled in their volume. So it's important to stay away from our streams, uh, especially with kids and pets, right. and uh, not have our pet, you know not have pets get stranded out in the islands and sure. uh, parts of our community, and not be throwing the tennis ball That's into right. <laughs> what normally is it a very yeah. innocuous little creek might be yeah. a lot um, yeah. a bigger deal this That's time right. of year. And then just watching the weather pattern, you know, there's a storm system coming again this weekend, and we're really watching for uh, for those real steep warm ups and also for uh, a rain event. You know, if we have a big rain event that brings down even more snow, and uh, and those are so those are really the weather patterns we're watching for, and, and we'll be warning the public if those things are coming. Okay, and then one of the great warning tools that we have is Summit County Alert, which is um, a tool that sends text messages, emails um, to folks, letting them know about right. um, of, um, events that they should be aware of. So, um, and people can sign up for that on. Um, the Summit County website. Right. Um, so that'll be um, a major channel that you'll use if it comes to that. That's right. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Any other tips about making property safer or have we pretty much covered all the bases? Well, I think we should just get out and enjoy our spring and uh, just be careful around water. And uh, if people have questions about their properties, then get in touch with someone today and uh, and and have something done around their properties today before there's an emergency. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Joel. Thanks. This has been great. And uh, stay tuned with us as we continue in our next segment of County Connection to talk about the Mountain Mentors Program. Welcome back to County Connection. For this segment, we are going to be talking about the Mountain Mentors Program, which is a project of the um, Summit County Youth and Family Services um, Department. And um, with me is Jesse Shoemaker, Matthew Martinez, and Jade Badges. And uh, so, Jesse, you are the bilingual program coordinator for Youth and Family Services, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so tell us a little bit about Mountain Mentors and the goals of that program. We're 
like you said, we're out of youth and family services, and what we do is match youth in the community one-on-one -on -one with a volunteer mentor in the program. Um, and you know, it's definitely a program that has some desired outcomes, uh, just based on having a friendship with an adult. Uh, kids often, um, they have a greater sense of self, they have a greater connection to their sense of their own future. And, you know, then there's other effects such as, you know, they attend school more regularly, get better grades, and less probability that they'll end up trying alcohol and drugs and things like that. Okay, and this program has been in place for quite a while, isn't that right? I think this is our 27th or 28th year. Okay, um, fantastic. Yes. And so what's your participation like? We have currently about 60 matches, I believe. Matches are the mentor-mentee pairs. And then we have about f almost the same amount on the wait list, about 56 kids on the wait list waiting for a mentor. Wow. And what are the ages of the kids who are the mentees? The kids are between the ages of 8 and 16. That said, primarily they're between 8 and 14, I would say, okay. are the ones who are waiting. Okay. And um, so you said 53 kids who are interested in taking part in this program who are on the wait list right now, and you guys are launching a campaign for June. Can you talk about that campaign? Yes, we're doing a, we call it the 30 and 30 campaign. We try to recruit 30 new mentors during the 30 days of June. And um, that in that way, kind of reduce uh, the number of kids waiting, sure. potentially. Right. So an ambitious goal, but definitely doable. Yes, right? I think so. I think so. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, let's turn to Jay and Matthew. Um, so Matthew, where do you go to school? Upper Blue Elementary. Upper Blue Elementary. All right. And how long have Jay and Matthew? How long have you guys been matched up through Mountain Mentors? We're coming up on two years. Nice. Mm -hmm. So you've built quite a friendship over the past couple of years. So what are, what are the types of activities you guys do together? Golf, frisbee golf, Rockies games. A Rockies game, cool. Um, so how about in the winter? Snowboarding. Cross yeah. country skiing. We, would, we do a million things. Nice. Yeah. Um, is Jay a pretty good snowboarder? Yes. Yeah. So who teaches who, how it goes? <laughs> I wouldn't really say it's about how how much skill you have. I just say it's about how much fun you have. Right on. That seems like a great philosophy. So where do you guys mostly go snowboarding? Over on PK, somewhere around there. Cool. Um, so Jay, how did you get involved with the program? Uh, I heard about it years ago and uh, had given it some thought and uh, finally put the uh, idea into action. And it was great because they matched me up with uh, Matthew here who I had known from a, um, from a summer camp I did uh, okay. at the rec center. So uh, it's worked out great and it's, um, it's super fun and it's, it, it's just a matter of three hours a week that you have to commit to and uh, it's well worth it. Um, I love hanging out with Matthew and we have the time of our lives. We awesome. have a blast. Great. Yeah. So what do you have, what big activities do you have on tap? Because school is about to get out, right? You have like a couple more days left. Um, golf. Um, frisbee golf and other summer activities cool. we could come up with. All right, Jay. Any other uh, things you guys? Oh, you we got have a million things in the works. We got yeah. the Rockies games coming up. The Eliches. There's a, a through the program. Um, there's a day at Eliches, and um, Matthew's a, an athlete, so everything outdoors, tennis, you know, soccer, basketball, football. He's an athlete, so we we do a lot of fun stuff outdoors in some some summertime. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, so in addition to the time that um, the matches spend kind of on their own together, there are activities that the whole program offers, is that right? Yes, we, we plan group activities each month, anywhere from three to five activities per month. And those can definitely be things that the matches plug into as part of their time together. And then um, they get the opportunity to spend time with us as staff, as well as meet other matches, get ideas on what they do for activities and, you know, come up with an endless list of different things to do around Summit County. Fantastic. And then, and what's the eligibility or the process? What are you looking for? To in be the a mentor. Mentors? Yeah. The, uh, 21 and older, you have to be age-wise. Uh, we ask for a year commitment from the date they're matched and that they spend roughly two, three hours a week, like Jay mentioned. And um, beyond that, the way the process works, uh, you fill out an application with a $25 fee. 
we do an in-home interview with each mentor. We do an orientation to kind of get you get you ready for what what it might mean. Mm -hmm. And we also call four references, and we run a background check and a driving record check. All right, so um, a fairly painless process. Yeah, it's you know it takes a little bit of time, but it's you know that's what we do. We try to make it seamless and smooth and. We also enjoy getting to know the mentors as well. Sure. All right, great. Um, so then how do people get in touch with you and find out more about being a mentor or get that application process rolling? Okay, there's a couple avenues you can go. The, I believe the applications are online. If you go to summitcares.org, there's a tab that says Mountain Mentors. Uh, we're one of the main tabs there at the top. Uh, there's in more information about the program, a lot of what we just talked about, and also a, a link to the application. Or you can give us a call, 970-668-9184 uh, is the number, and we'd be more than happy to fill anybody in with any questions or any doubts that they have. Fabulous. All right, so help Youth and Family Services meet their 30 for 30 goal that's running now through the end of June, and um, get in touch with Jesse or the fine staff um, there at Youth and Family Services. Uh, thanks so much, Jesse and Matthew and Jay. Thank you. Thank you. And stay tuned. Uh, next, we will be talking about open space and trails in Summit County. Welcome back to County Connection. Uh, for this segment, we are going to be talking about open space and trails as we approach the season where we're going to be using them all the time. Um, and with me is the Director of Open Space and Trails for Summit County Government, Brian Lorch, and the Open Space and Trails Planner for the Town of Breck, Scott Reed. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Um, so, lots of folks know that uh, both the county and the town have great open space programs, um, very ambitious, robust programs with great goals and a lot of great successes. Um, but a lot of there's a lot of collaboration where you guys work off of each other. Can you talk about some of that those collaborative efforts? Sure, Julie. Um, yeah, we've been working together for over 15 years. Our first purchase was um, back in '97 together. Um, and since that time, we've purchased almost four or a little over 4,000 acres together. So oh, wow. a lot of purchases that we've done is joint purchases. Um, with that kind of land, you comes along with it management. And so we've been in the recent years moving more and more towards managing these properties together. Um, trails projects, um, we took on a, a open space management plan for the Golden Horseshoe, which is an area outside of Breckenridge. Um, that took several years and now after doing all that whole planning process, we're now in the process where we also through that process worked with the Forest Service because they own a lot of the property around that, which is always the case in Summit County, which makes things interesting, all the multiple agencies that are managing here. Right. Um, but we're now ready to kick off several new trail projects this next year um, and over the next couple of years um, to connect a bunch of the trails in that area that are I think it'll be a really great facility for people to, that, that enjoy our trails. Okay, and then can you talk about why the collaboration is important, why the county doesn't kind of just go off on its own and find some parcels to purchase and um, then Breck would do the same? What's the benefit of it's, working together? It really is all about leveraging our funds. You know, we, um, we both have limited funds and a lot of different places that we'd like to put those funds and so um, it's been great to have the town of Breckenridge looking outside of their narrow boundaries of, the, of their town and actually looking at the whole Upper Blue um, and helping us out to protect that area. And we've really been able to protect a lot more than we would have just because of the land values in Summit County compared to the, minimum, the, the amount of money that we have to spend. Okay, great. I think it makes really both, both programs much stronger to have that partnership component. We work really hard together to manage these properties as well, but the acquisitions are really the foundation of that. So um, like Brian mentioned, um, the majority of the property that we own and manage as open space, at least on the town side of things, um, are jointly held with the county. And so um, we leverage as we purchase these things and we also manage them um, jointly, which I think is, can be complicated and can be challenging at times, but it's also, I think, better for the whole and everyone has an idea of how to manage this thing. And, and I think we move ahead together as a, as a partnership. It's really strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think a lot of people, it makes sense. Um, acquiring the parcels, right, and protecting open space from development or what have you. But um, so what about the management piece of it? What does that look like? 
Well, we work together. Uh, we plan out our, you know, every year we have a list of projects that we plan to do and do together. So certainly there are projects that the town solely does within the town limits on town-owned um, property. And the same is okay. true for the county. But for the joint parcels and joint trails that we manage, um, we tend to work together and, you know, scope out even two to three years of what our projects will be. Um, like Brian mentioned, this summer we um, we were lucky, or this past winter we were able to get permission to construct a number of new trails that will help connect, it will help complete the vision that was set forth in the travel management plan and really help complete the uh, the travel network out there that, that uh, folks have long dreamed about. So in other words, we'll have connections that will, um, an example would be Turk's Trail is one of the trails we're working on this summer. Um, for a long time, the trail kind of looped back on itself. And this, this summer we'll be able to complete the, the, the trail so that it connects all the way up to Sally Barber Road and there, thereby allowing folks to bypass French Gulch Road um, if they're on a non-motorized, you know, if they're hikers or bikers, that kind of stuff. So uh, visions of trails that have been long-standing, we've been able to finally get permission to do um, this year. So. Okay, great. Um, how about other highlights um, coming up um, through these collaborative efforts? Again, we have about eight new trails that we're looking to complete um, in the next two years, and we actually jointly applied for a grant as well through the Colorado State Parks and Wildlife uh, State Trails Program. And uh, that's going to offset our costs. Um, the grant is for about $100,000. And um, so we'll be able to contribute both of our portions into that. And it's just a number of, as I said, eight different segments of trail. Um, ZL Trail is a new one that will help connect from the highlands out to the, um, out to the Colorado Trail area, the Three Forks of the Swan area. Um, we've got a number of trails over closer to the town of Breckenridge, including Aspen Alley will get realigned. A number of other trails um, that will provide new connections that have long, you know, we've long dreamt of, I guess. So um, that's on the on the docket for this summer. And we also, I, I guess, would mention is that we we leverage the program both with grant funding, um, with partnerships, and also with volunteers. And so pretty much any of the projects that we do this summer, we have you know a number of volunteer projects that are joint um, you know, town county volunteer projects that allow us to accomplish those goals. Okay, great. And so um, for people who would sign up for some of these volunteer opportunities, what sorts of projects and what kind of work would they be doing? Well, this weekend we have a tree planting. The town is actually, I believe the county has a similar yeah. one uh, elsewhere, but we have two lo different locations where we're doing um, tree planting, so helping reforest the county. Um, and it's also a benefit um, in part for uh, the Bristlecone Foundation, which uh, helps with hospice care. Okay. Um, beyond that, we have uh, Galena Ditch Trail is one of the ones that we had constructed a couple of years ago. We're trying to combine that with some other trails that we have in the, in the system. So we have what we're calling the Galena Extension. Um, that's one of our projects for the summer that will have multiple dates. I think the 16th of June and the 28th of June are dates that we're, we're going to be having those as well. Um, our big project where we get about 300 people for a two-day project. Um, this summer is on July 26th and 27th. Um, it is, as I mentioned before, Upper Turks. So we're connecting Turks Trail up with Sally Barber Road. Um, and like I said, we'll have about 150 people each day, thereabouts, wow. who come in and create a new trail in a weekend. And it's pretty amazing to see. So. Um, and so what could people expect to, to be doing? Are they, like, they have shovels and moving rocks and everything that you yep. would imagine? <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of work with hand tools. Um, uh -huh. You know, we usually start early in the morning, and it's not like we make people work beyond their abilities or anything else. There's, a tr there's training and there's ability to, um, I think most people really enjoy the, enjoy the day when they come out and, and, and join us. Uh-huh, great. And, um, and the county also has a, a program where people can adopt sections of trail too, is that right, Brian? Yeah, we have a adopt a trail program for the rec path, which okay. usually about a mile segment, something like that, where either businesses or individuals can adopt the trails. Um, and then we also do the same thing for several of our open spaces that get a lot of use. Um, we have people adopt them and they um, kind of take a commitment for the summer to to help us manage that and they're the volunteers because we have a small program um, our volunteers are our eyes and ears out on the ground and, and we really do um, need the people to come out and help us because um, it's the difference between really getting these these great properties able to be used by the public mm -hmm. and so what kinds of things would they be noticing that and bringing to your attention when you say they're kind of the eyes and ears well it can be anything from helping us to clean up trash or helping to 
clear something off the, the rec path to letting us know if there's a problem that, um, you know, so someone dumps something that they can't deal with or, you know, there's any sort of problem, um, you know, fence line issues, all sorts of things that do come up over time. Okay, great. Um, so speaking um, about trails, um, single track and not the rec path, but um, trails through the backcountry and so forth, um, we are... Uh, just on the cusp between spring and summer, we've had a lot of snow. There's a lot of snow still up there. So um, what are some ways that um, people should be um, approaching their use of, um, of all these trails while um, things might be pretty wet out there still? Well, we start by encouraging people to educate themselves about which trails are available and dry. We do have a list on our website. The town of Breckenridge does, at least. Um, BreckenridgeTrails.org is the website. And on there, we have a list of trail conditions, and it lists out which trails we believe are dry and ready for action and which aren't. Oh, great. Um, generally speaking, however, if people are out there and they're, they haven't gone there already, they can kind of come across an isolated muddy spot. We ask folks to go through and not around isolated muddy spots. But if, um, if they reach you know, a long strip of, of, uh, of mud or snow or something in between, um, we really ask that they turn around and go somewhere else, um, that we really try to focus you know, our, our summer is very short. We, rec we acknowledge that and appreciate that. Um, but also, <clears throat> we spend a lot of time repairing ruts and trail damage from people this time of year. And so, um, in, our, in our sense of the, wor of the world, we would rather be building new trails and creating the better experience for people rather than repairing damage that's been done by others. So we ask folks to, <clears throat> again, use their own ethical sense to say, well, this kind of trail damage is not going not gonna to be good for, it, for anyone, really, for these community assets. And so that's a big part of it. Having them avoid it and stay on the rec path is a great thing. Um, I happen to know right now that uh, the Frisco Peninsula is dry, uh, so there are some okay. things that are dry and available um, within the town itself. It's the River Trail, it's Betty's Trail. Um, uh, some of the, the flumes, the lower flume and middle flume, are getting there or dry enough to, to, be, to use some use. But, um, you know, inevitably you're going you're gonna to come across, you're going to reach a point where you say to yourself, really, should I be here? And the answer is probably no, if you're questioning that. If you're okay. leaving a rut, <laughs> if you're leaving a footprint really deeply in the trail, that's going to be something we have to repair later. So we just ask people to, to respect that and understand they are community assets that we want to take care of. Right. And it may not occur to people necessarily that that footprint or what have you is, is having a lasting impact, but in fact it does, that that can last for months. It can harden that it. way and make it difficult for other users. It can gather more water or, tre or trench more water down the tread, which we don't want. So, um, you know, again, the, the, the hope is that people have a good ethical sense of that it's probably not the time to use these trails. And, and certainly we, we are more excited than anybody to get these things open. So as, we are, as they're available, we'll definitely let folks know. Okay, so you mentioned the rec path, um, so that's a great option. Um, and as in most years, there's repair, maintenance, some um, new projects um, on the rec path. So Brian, why don't you let us know what's in store this, uh, this summer? Sure, we have a, a bunch of projects going. One is we are um, in the final phases of completing the rec path up by Copper that connects from 10 Mile, makes two connections to Highway 91 there at Copper. Um, we anticipate a grand opening in mid-June, mid to late June, haven't yet set the date, um, but that should be a grand opening right now. Which I think that'll be a, a really great connection yeah, there. Really, It really will make a good connection to, to Copper instead of running along the, the frontage road there. Right. Um, Copper is also um, working to stripe bike lanes through Copper Road all the way through Copper, so it'll be clear where to go and um, and um, we're also working on signage on the rec path. We're going to be putting mile markers throughout the rec path um, and also a lot more wayfinding signage, especially like Keystone, which has in the past been a little difficult to figure your way uh -huh. through. Um, yeah. There'll be a lot more wayfinding signage in Keystone and then throughout the system. Um, I think those mile markers will be great. I mean, yeah. sometimes when I'm really, you know, digging deep, but <laughs> it's helpful to have you actually that got somewhere. One more mile. <laughs> yep. Um, and then um, we also just are in the process of finishing up crack sealing on the on the thing. We have a new product that we're crack sealing the entire rec pass system. Oh, great. And it's lost a lot of the. The, the real ridges that were there and some of the cracks. Excellent. And it's a lot so. better. I was out there this weekend and it, oh. it really is a, a lot nicer than the loop around the lake. Um, so people can look forward to a little bit yeah. smoother ride. Yep. Um, Good. And most of our rec path has new 
new pavement in the last couple of years. We're repaving the section from about Keystone Golf Course, the far side of Keystone Golf Course down to Summit Cove. Um, that section is closed intermittently right now because they're doing the repaving job right now. Um, so there is, during the day, you will have to go out on Highway 6 to get around that, that section right okay. now, but they're hoping to have that done um, well before the 4th of July. Excellent. Um, uh, other projects, we've got the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, um, uh, that's most of the main projects. Oh, 10 Mile Canyon is one of the questions that people have been asking when that's going to open. Right. Um, well, because it's <laughs> a great ride up to, up along the 10 Mile, yeah. and then certainly for folks who are looking to ride up um, to Vail Pass and through Copper, et cetera. Um, but it's a little, uh, it, it takes a little while to open that up. Yeah, most years we're opening it right about now. Um, we wait and we get up, get together with the Avalanche Information Center um, to get the clearance because the last thing we want to do is have someone um, buried in an avalanche, Absolutely. and that's a that's a reality. It really those avalanche shoots. There's about a dozen avalanche shoots along that thing, and they let loose in the spring, um, often well after everything else is dry, and so people right. think well, why shouldn't I be up there? And in fact, it can be very dangerous. Well, this year's a unusual year in that we had about seven of them run bigger than they have in a lot of years. And um, a lot of trees and debris ran all the way across the wreck path, all the way down into the creek. Um, and so we are actually having to rent equipment to get this debris off the wreck path this year. And so right. it's a... And it's a, a tremendous amount of debris. It right? really is. I mean, some of these piles, how high would you say they oh, are? Oh, there's probably 14 or 15 feet high on the, on the wreck path. Right, with entire trees yeah. and s snow and yeah. all kinds of debris under there, so... So yeah, it's um, what we... We have to... The reason why we have to get different equipment than normal is we don't want to wreck the wreck path in the, in the process. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we're going to be having to move all that off. And I'm sure this weekend losing some of the snow will help, but it's still pretty big project. Great. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a great summer in store, some really fantastic projects. And um, and for folks who do want to get involved in the volunteer opportunities that you have available, how would they get in touch with you at the Town of Breck? Ours again would be breckenridgetrails.org. Okay. And at the county? And ours is on the Summit County website, which I think was uh, said a couple of times in this thing, but it's... Uh, co.summit.co.us or just Google Summit County and, and look and for the open there. space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. This has been fun and we'll look forward to a great summer. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. And to those of you at home, thanks so much for joining us on County Connection and uh, we will catch you next time.